Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, I'm here with Eric Wright, co-founder and chief content creator at GTM Delta. And today we're going to dive into some platform engineering tools. Um, the reason why is because there are a lot of tools out there that are marketed and vendored and all of these good things around platform engineering. Uh, but the reality is, is that they're not really doing much for platform engineering, right? So I've I've kind of come up with a list of my own uh, that I believe is actually dedicated towards platform engineering. And uh, Eric, maybe you have a list of your own as well. But what I want to do is I want to bring in a UI here really quick. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to show the websites and then I'm going to kind of show the way that they work. I'm going to bring up VS code and then I'll bring up a web browser. So I'll show you what the website is and then I'll show you the code piece of it as well. So I'll bring up uh, VS code. So the first is backstage and backstage, I feel like is uh, one of those tools where it's talked about a lot, but not a lot of people are like really diving into it. So uh, one of the things about Backstage that I really enjoy is that it's an open source IDP. Uh, one of the things I really hate about Backstage is that you have to do everything in JavaScript. So like, for, yeah, so like from the deployment Ooh, JavaScript. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like from the deployment to the importing of, of various tools and stuff like that, like it's all JavaScript. Um, so if I just, well, this is, it's always the funny thing that when, with, I think like my, so my origins come out of traditional, I'll say like legacy operations. So like virtual machine operations, cloud ops, uh, did a lot with OpenStack. I ended up dabbling with Python purely because of OpenStack being, you know, based on, we have Python and Django. I was a Ruby on rails you know, user, like developer before, not developer, like I build stuff using Ruby on Rails. And then prior to that, I did a lot of VB script and .NET stuff, mostly because I was doing, I was all in on my Microsoft technologies. And it's funny now, like I've avoided JavaScript as long as possible. <laughs> and a lot of the VMware toolkit, you started to integrate JavaScript, but I found like it just didn't really properly implement it. And so nobody needed to learn more than copy paste JavaScript. So like, I'd love to get your thoughts. Like as you look at maybe a new operator that's making the move to like from say legacy or traditional cloud ops, like more IaaS style operations, is JavaScript like kind of a place to be? Like how, what's what's the language of, of choice that you find people needing to tackle for like configuration languages? I would say, I mean, I always write in Go. Uh, I have a, a good friend of mine, Chris, that is uh, trying to push me towards Rust. He's <laughs> like, yeah. so um, I, I, I think I'm going to, I'll start dabbling in Rust at some point relatively soon. Um, but he's very much pushing me towards that. And he's like, you should definitely check out Rust. Um, but I mean, I feel like I just do so much in Go at this point. Very rarely do I do anything in JavaScript. Uh, and, 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 not for any other reason other than like the dependencies, I, in my opinion, are such a major mess. Um, I'll give you a, give you an example, right? Like with Backstage, we can see on the screen here to even install Backstage, right? You need uh, to use NPM. So NPM is like a, uh, the JavaScript package manager. And the thing about that is we can even see right here when you're uh, utilizing Node. So JavaScript is like the, the, the language, right? Node is like the server side component. So JavaScript naturally is for web-based apps, but then you have Node and Node is like the server side piece of it. So like backend stuff. Pack, backstage doesn't allow for anything newer than uh, version 18. <laughs> so I'm, and, and we're at like version 20 right now. So <laughs> So, so I, I mean, like when I was first deploying backstage, um, I was sitting there like banging my head against a wall. Like, why am I getting so many dependency errors? And the reason why was because I was on version 20. So I had to like reconfigure, roll back and then put uh, 18 on and then I was fine. So like that, I don't know. I would say like that, that's my biggest gripe is like all of the dependencies that are necessary. 
it's like going back to Java. Like that was the always the <laughs> dread of like, you know, write once, run anywhere. But what it were, turned out to be was write once, run slow anywhere. And <laughs> only with like locked in versions. And yep. that was the, because the problem you get is like, number one, do they support go forward transition between major versions? Because going from 18 to 20 was, was pretty significant changes in a lot of the core. Right. And then on top of that, like, are they going to, like, presuming they're holding back, I hope that they have good, clean deprecation. Because that's one of the biggest issues, too, is that people, when they went to serverless, everybody's like, I'm going to go all in on serverless. So like, that's great. But number one, where are you going to store your code? How are you going to organize it in a way that makes sense as an application context, which is really tough to represent in just like raw serverless, like the UI of a serverless you know, let's just be honest. We're talking Lambda. Like when I say serverless, I mean Lambda. <laughs> right? Just like when we say containerization, we mean Kubernetes. Like uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I get it. But <laughs> the issue then became, you know, locking into a particular version because AWS in particular only supported certain versions. And then you think, okay, great. I build, let's say I build a thousand applications. It's not mm -hmm. unheard of for a financial services place probably has like two, 3,000 applications that they build and operate internally. Right. But then all of a sudden you go, oh, yeah, Backstage is moving, you know, Node is moving, whatever it is. And all of a sudden you have 2,000 applications to go back. Like, is it actually going to carry forward? One of my Ruby on Rails apps just like totally bit the dust because I did a major, major update to the Rails version and it just wiped out a bunch of things. So I had to roll back. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's my gripe about versions because I, I always used to dread that your your platform ultimately creates a range of lock-in. Right, right. Which is acceptable. Yeah. Acceptable range of lock-in. We're not going to get rid of lock-in. It's impossible because if you could say, I'm going all open source, I'm going to use Backstage so there's no lock-in. Huh. Well, check your Node version. You're locked in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's always been like the funny thing for me has like, people always choose open source because they're like, yeah, I don't, I don't want vendor lock-in. And I'm like, like, like I, I heard that so many times with, with Otel open telemetry and people were like, Oh, I don't, I'm going to use Otel cause I don't want vendor lock-in. And I'm like, yeah, but you, now you're locked into open telemetry. <laughs> yeah. And you're relying and not realizing that the primary contributors to open telemetry are AWS, Cisco, and Juniper. <laughs> like you're not escaping vendor lock-in. They're going to support Otel, but because they're contributing to it. So you're actually kind of like, it's like not going to one clothing store and going to the one across the hallway, but they're owned by the same parent company. Like let's exactly let's just get over it. Yeah. So, so there's always lock in somewhere. Like maybe you're not locked into like a closed source vendor, but you're still locked into something. Um, so, so then the second one is canoe and canoe is interesting. This is actually being built in an open source fashion uh, from a few folks from AWS. Now it is only no, Maybe it's only AWS centric right now. I forget. Um, but really what it is, is it's Backstage and Argo CD. And I forget. There, uh, if you and look at all of the actual proprietary bits, but what's right. like, as far as an architecture, it's, it's better in that they're bringing more stuff into the way that they look at the the level of like what actually touches other things directly, you know, they may be loosely coupled components, but they're closely related and loosely coupled. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because it's, it's almost like, like if you look up the back stack, uh, it's backstage Argo CD, uh, cross plane and, uh, Kyverno, uh, policy manager. Uh, like similar, similar to Opa, but it's interesting because like, this is actually, this is a uh, canoe is like a product based on a stack, but then like now we're starting to see these stacks kind of pop up in the platform engineering landscape, which is, is interesting because that's what we need. Right. Because like when you look at the CNCF landscape and there are over like 1200 tools, um, everybody's <laughs> kind of scratching their head at this point. Right. Because it's like, it's cumbersome. Like it's not that it's confusing. It's very cumbersome to figure out like what you should be 
choosing, uh, you know, what tool you should be choosing. So that, that's why I'm kind of liking these stocks here. Well, and the one thing I would love to actually see, although it would take a, uh, we'd have to rent out the Vegas sphere in order to put it all on one screen, is that same periodic table of the CNCF, you know, platform in and product set. But actually to have the commercial alternatives that are operated by the same companies that offer the open source. Cause mm -hmm. that's an interesting thing of like, is there an enterprise alternative to it? Cause a lot of people would go and they say, Hey, if I'm going to choose Cilium, am I choosy because I like Cilium cause it's open source or am I choosy because I have isovalent because right. I can get an enterprise build around it or, you know, or in Cisco, as it turns out, you know, <laughs> after the news <laughs> yesterday. So, um, and same thing with, you know, Solo has support for Stilium. So what you end up yeah. is not just having to select a product like Canoe, but what's the adjacent support ecosystem for more than just your developers being the people that know all about it. Right. And, and that's always the interesting part about figuring out like what tool you're going to use in general, but uh, especially in like the, the cloud native Kubernetes platform engineering realm where it's like, you want open source, but, and I always think about it like enterprise versus homegrown. So like enterprise, like, like and, and I think I always use this example because I think it's perfect is like Datadog versus like the Grafana stack. Like Datadog, you have everything. You have APM, you have logging, you have tracing, you have metrics, you have standard monitoring, you have imports that you can do. Like there's so many different things you can do. Obviously you're paying a premium because it's SaaS and it's all under one roof. Whereas the Grafana stack, you can create everything that Datadog has and it works great. But now here's the question that I have for you. Do you want it supported for you or are you going to hire engineers to support it internally? Either way, you're paying. You're, you're paying in some way, shape or form. It's just a matter of which one do you want to pay for. Right. And it becomes the... Uh, expected value calculation that you have to do is we used to see this with the OpenStack ecosystem. A lot of people fought back on it because they said, well, now I need to hire OpenStack operators. Right. And that meant that they were a specialized skill set. And then it happened with Kubernetes. We've got sort of that same potential. But if there's a large enough ecosystem around it, there's going to be a large support and you know some kind of enterprise support ecosystem or productization of, of services around it. Right. So, yeah, I, I know it's it sounds very wishy washy to say like, eh, it depends. But that's really yeah. <laughs> what it is. Is like I I love the open source because it allows people to innovate on both sides. But if it's so profoundly good as a business story, like look at the HashiCorp ecosystem. Right. Massive adoption on the open source really struggled with getting enterprise uptake because the open source one had been so strongly out in the market that people just built teams around the knowledge. And the risk you run into there is if, I mean, that's fairly general, but when you get into something like backstage, you're narrowing the, the field of people who will have that depth of knowledge. Right. And if someone you have is so bloody good, they're also like ripe to get picked by your competitor because yep. you've given them <laughs> skills to be this amazing platform engineer. Yep. And this is interesting. We just had a comment coming in about uh, AWS modded backstage product, which that's how you know that they're doing that. The you know a product is doing well when AWS <laughs> comes up with a version like. <laughs> yeah, this is interesting. Uh, the default OPA. Okay, now this is so right off the bat. I'm confused, right? Because OPA to me is open policy agent, but I don't think that's what this means. Yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks like the entry point is the, the AWS CDK, and backstage is what's running underneath the hood. Yeah, it, let's look. Oh, I think what they're doing is they've got a reference implementation. This is not unlike running like the console uh, spin up in AWS, where you can run like it's still purely open source console. They've just given you a reference deployment so right. that you've got like some level of resiliency and it's tacked into the other adjacent stuff like RDS. Um, so I think that's probably what's happening. And look, if it goes really well, that means that they're likely going to then just open up backstage as a service. The main reason why I would look at this is that it's likely that if people are backstage heavy, 
they're using that API to manage and operate. So they're building tools on top of that API, right. which means that, you know, if it's widely used, a la Redis, you know, we've seen many, many open source tools where let's just give a Redis compatible API to mm -hmm. an, you know, to DynamoDB or to an, al an alternative in, uh, in AWS or, or Azure. Or Google, sorry, I, I always forget about this. The, that little, that little search company there. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, so playing devil's advocate for a second, right? Like this is always kind of my gripe here. Now we see AWS building particular products in this realm, and we see the same thing with Canoe, and Canoe is AWS centric as well. But then we see things like Microsoft Radius, right? And I'm going to show code for this in just a second, but radius works can we not choose product names that are based on technologies that exist in the market today <laughs> radius is a protocol for <laughs> for god's sakes oh sorry and we got opa we got radius sorry there's there's nothing i can't wait until they have a new product called i am just to say like <laughs> well you, you know um as as a wise song was once uh, titled, you can't always get what you want, and we are not going to get what we want uh, because you know vendors and and tools and products always give these wacky names for things like like that AWS Open thing that's going to confuse the the living crap out of me uh, for for months and probably years to come because I'm going to keep thinking Open Policy Agent. Um, but the reason that I like Radius is because. Radius is based, and, and I'm going to answer this question here in just a second. Let, let me come back to it. But Radius is interesting because it's for Azure and AWS. And that's why I got to give it to Microsoft because Microsoft is really, really good at um, incorporating other, other tools and other clouds and other platforms into what they're building. Uh, which is why I really like it. Like I like the fact that you can use radio. And this is what can you imagine going back 15 years? Like I'm I'm an older fella, so I've <laughs> I've, I've seen a lot of anti Microsoft uh, oh, yeah. waves of hatred in my years, and like oh, yeah. it's come and gone. But it's so wild that they have done such a good job of being a very open ecosystem. And 100%. I mean, that's likely the work of amazing folks like Hanselman and you know Jeff Hicks and like the early yeah. real product and and interface builders interface not being like you know h like human like user interface of like a ui but truly mm -hmm. how do you interact with their ecosystem and the fact that powershell became open now powershell can control anything else and that yeah like you said they want to just say use microsoft with any of your tools like mm -hmm. fantastic 100 percent, yeah and I, I think that that's really like the transition that we've seen over the years is like Microsoft is, I mean, Microsoft has went from like blatantly saying open source is the devil to like, you know, <laughs> the majority of their products at this point are open source. Um, and, and, and this is like, this is another part here, which is super interesting is this is a radius configuration, but underneath the hood, this is bicep. And Bicep is uh, Microsoft's <laughs> language with ARM underneath the hood because ARM is if you've never used appropriately ARM, named, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, <laughs> and if you haven't used ARM, uh, you know, well, here's the thing: if you haven't used ARM, go and try ARM. And once you pull your hair out because you're sick of looking at tape, <laughs> on, come once and use you're Bicep. Hating your existence, then <laughs> exactly. But the cool, the interesting thing is. Bicep is a Microsoft specific language, but you use a Bicep configuration to deploy to AWS. Very interesting. Um, and again, it just kind of goes to show like the openness uh, of Azure in general, which is really cool. But the, uh, the, the, the meat of the code is this here, where what this will do is using Microsoft's APIs, I can create an nginx container for example so the whole idea behind radius is you as the platform engineer you build the configuration uh and then you give this configuration to your internal engineers or developers and say hey use this command and deploy it so you as the engineer you're building the solution and you're giving it to the developer to use later on 
And we had a yeah, question. I think oh, sorry, that's Eric, the idea of the like what we really need, and like so why I ended up latching onto Ruby on Rails and loving the language was because actually. I, I really misunderstood it. And I got to give a huge shout out to Jody Alkama, who watched me painfully try to explain what Rails and Ruby and Ruby on Rails was to my manager, who was like, we're a Java shop. And I just the understanding of it as being a DSL based, you know, in Ruby. But it was like hard to explain, like, is Rails the server? Just the same way as we'd say we're using JavaScript. Well, then that means you need Node. Oh, and you mm -hmm. want to run packages? You need NPM and Bower and this. I'm like... So when you say you're using JavaScript, you're actually using nine tools. You, <laughs> JavaScript's the core language on it. Same with Ruby on Rails. It's just that it was more encapsulated. So I do love that idea that this can become effectively a DSL for cloud, which is really what we want. Right. Like that's why we want an IDP. An IDP is like, give me one place to go where I can pull in all of the libraries and dependencies and components required and then have it you know, be loosely coupled, but actually deliver what I want in one interface so that I've got less places to go digging as a developer and, and a platform engineer. Right. Yeah. And, and that kind of goes to this question here, uh, suggesting a tool to learn for platform engineering. Now, here's my take on it. Uh, number one, right, we're going through a bunch of tools via this live stream right now. And these are the tools that I believe you should be focusing on right now. I believe that there is there's a lot of markety hype and a lot of vendory hype around platform engineering. But once you peel back the onion a little bit, there's a lot of, oh, wait, this has nothing to do with platform engineering. Um, they're just slapping the platform engineering name on it because it sounds <laughs> yeah. good. And that's the unfortunate reality, right? Um, but here's what I would say. Number one, keep watching the live stream, right? And figure out what other tools we're talking about. Number two, uh, and, and if you allow me to be a little bit cheeky, follow my content because uh, <laughs> I'm talking about everything platform engineering and the various tools and stuff like that. Eric, uh, he's putting out a ton of great stuff around Kubernetes and platform engineering. Steve Buchanan, uh, he's a principal PM at Microsoft. He puts out a lot of stuff around Kubernetes and platform engineering. Christina Devochko, she puts out a ton of stuff around platform engineering. Uh, there's a ton of really great people in the, in the space that are putting out great, great stuff around platform engineering. But I'll, 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 I'll wrap up the question with this and then I'll hand it over to Eric uh, if you would like to answer it too. Platform engineering isn't about tooling. Platform engineering is about customer service and going into an environment with a product mindset. So platform engineering, we are, uh, we're not bringing in a lot of new tools and a lot of new platforms. What we're bringing in is a customer service mindset around who we're building the tools for. So your customer or your client as a platform engineer isn't anybody external. It is your internal developers, your internal engineers, the people that are using your product. So it's actually way less about the tool that you're going to use and way more about going into things with a product mindset and going into things uh, with a customer service mindset. Yeah, I agree. And, and Gaurav's got a great question there, right? It's always this trick of like, where do we begin, you know? And quite often, like, you just can't even, like, get that first thing. Do we start with the IDE? Like, okay, so we've generally chosen that. We love the idea of using something like, you know, VS Code. And look, we can, then you get stuck on VS Code versus Sublime Text, or, or <laughs> you know, you've got Eclipse, whatever your, your IDE or IDP of choice is we get stuck on like the smallest little things. But like you said, what we're really doing as a platform engineer, it's a process model, not a plat, not a product model. As far as like what, how we adopt it, we're developing processes in the same way that like SRE was designed that you have much more ownership of the application operations from start to production and then continuously. So that life cycle, the application, it's really about how do we do life cycle operations. And it just means that platform engineers and platform operators are way more code savvy or code centric than we would have been before in a traditionally like web UI, you know, right click, do this thing. Mm -hmm. So it's to Gaurav's point, like what are the tools you want to use? Find the most comfortable, you know, IDE that you enjoy, set it up as dark mode because that's a thing, right? Like, and then once you do, once you do that, then it's like, okay, well, who are your most likely 
application builders that you're supporting and what are their what's their toolkit. So mm-hmm. we have to be this we're basically going back to the generalist again. Mm-hmm. And the more that you understand the languages you're supporting for the applications, the more likely you're going to find out what you actually need to learn. Right. Yep, totally agree. 100%. It's 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 ironic um just how much it's the tooling doesn't change, which is why I'm only talking about like six or while why we're only talking about like six to seven tools at this point, because it's not about like the tooling. It's really about like going into things with a particular mindset, uh, which, you know, again, is, is interesting in itself because uh, and I don't want to go down a tangent. Uh, we're, I mean, I usually do, but platform engineering wasn't built to create like this new set of tooling. It was very much built to go into things with a product mindset, with a customer service mindset. And that's the key behind it. Like the key behind platform engineering isn't, hey, let's create new tools for platform engineering. It's, hey, let's use our existing tools, but make let's make the lives of everybody using them far easier. Bingo. Yeah, I mean, and the, the, the operational methodology is what you really want to learn is a combination, I'll I'll say, I'm coming from a different angle, so I will always skew towards be aware of traditional cloud, or so like cloud native technologies, ephemeral workloads, scale outs, you know, we want to have that idea of like scale to zero type of capabilities, but also be acutely aware that you're going to be seeing long running workloads that are going to move into your purview, right? So you won't have a choice, but to be able to operate both application ops models. And so whatever tooling you need to support that, you need to be able to obviously observe it, which means right. you need monitoring logs, traces, the usual, even just monitoring and logging, at least if you get that. Once you get into tracing, that's actually the developer, it, that means that's code, right? That's actually now a, a change in the code flow because they mm-hmm. have to include tracing. It's not like it's just drop in and 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 throw a library and in a go. It's like, no, 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 you have to include traces throughout. So whenever he talks about like, I need to learn tracing, like, well, you need to learn how to evaluate traces as part of your purpose, which was to observe the environment, you know, infer the state of the environment, when the state becomes unhealthy, then how do you get to healthy? Yep. Yeah, that's, it's basically the method and, and the, the tools just become to use Grafana, Prometheus, you know, whatever your, your Jaeger stack, whatever your, your many, many stacks are like that's <laughs> just be aware of the way to do it. Like, cause I can go into Grafana. I can go into Datadog. I can go into Prometheus and I can generally dig around because I know what are the things that I'm looking for. Like, what are the golden signals, stuff like that. Agreed. All right. So next on the list, Cradix, Cradix. <laughs> I know. I oh. struggle with this one every time, too. I'm like, yeah, I, 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 I hope I can see somebody else say it. <laughs> apologies if I'm, I'm messing that up. But um, so the whole idea is you have like this promise, right? Now, the promise is a uh, it's it's using a kubernetes api right so it's an operator it's extended for kubernetes and then you have this idea of a promise and what essentially ends up happening is and you can see i'm and i'm going to show this in the in the in the gui in a second because it's showing it in the gui uh i think allows it to make as a rails user the pluralization makes me want to stick a pen in my eye (laughs) So, because Rails Rails pluralization would know observabilities should be I E S, even though there's like neither are real words. But sorry, that, that would, uh, I anything that doesn't do pluralization like Rails just makes me want to you know yell at somebody. Hey, who called the grammar police? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But yes, a uh, 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 gra- grammar police aside, the the whole idea here is we're essentially creating that this whole idea of a promise is like creating an as a service. So you're implementing a promise that observability will be there as a service, and then you can configure it for your users, being the developers, the engineers, et cetera, based on what they want to utilize it for, 
which is interesting. Um, so I'm just going to, I want to flip over to the GUI really quick, just because showing this marketplace. So if you go to this marketplace, there are all these community promises that you can use. And you have like everything from like Jenkins, Redis, Postgres, Slack, et cetera, um, Argo. And then like what you can do is you can utilize these promises, just like I showed in VS Code, um, to actually set up this like as a service methodology, uh, which, you know, again, interesting. Yeah, because it, yeah, it's... The, con the concept came from promise theory, which is basically analyzing the interaction of, of disparate components and how they behave mm -hmm. together. It's how a lot of the networking core components came together. And it's also a bit of a pull from like Puppet used to talk about desired state management and the idea that as a promise, the promise is that you're effectively assigning an SLA as of the, where the service is, not in like percentage availability, but what are the components of the serv service? And then I thus promise that these services will be available in some level. Uh, so it's a neat like kind of DSL on how to make sure that that service is alive and well. Interesting. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> uh, by the way, this is what uh, happens when you're old. I, I read way too many things and I, I, I got grilled on promise theory by my friend Cody Bunch in an interview one day. And I'll, I've, I've always enjoyed how painful it was <laughs> to have to explain it, but uh, it was, it was wild, super theoretical reading, but very, very cool in like, it feeds a lot of the concepts of DevOps and SaaS operations. So awesome. So, uh, by the way, we have like 30 people here. So if you have questions, please ask them. Uh, the, the the solution that we're using here, StreamYard, this allows us to see all the comments from all the different locations. So if you have any questions, just pop it in the comment uh, or however it's shown for you because uh, we're streaming like four different places right now. Uh, so please feel free to ask any questions that you'd like. Now, the next thing that I'll talk about here that we'll talk about here is cross-plane. Now, Crossplane, if I'm allowed to pick favorites, uh, which maybe I'm not, I don't know, but Crossplane is arguably my favorite piece to the puzzle, and I'll tell you why. If you combine the power of Kubernetes operators, which is you know uh, control uh, controllers and CRDs, right, to extend the API and to have your reconciliation loop for your self healing and, and all that good stuff, if you combine operators with Crossplane. And with kubevert, you have now successfully given Kubernetes the ability to be the platform of choice. I can extend the API to do whatever I want. I can use kubevert to uh, run and install and manage VMs. And I can use crossplane to which I'm going to show you right here to literally create any resource I want outside of Kubernetes. So if you look here, for example, I'm literally using a Kubernetes manifest to create an Azure virtual network. Here, I am literally using a Kubernetes manifest to create an S3 bucket. Nothing to do with Kubernetes other than Kubernetes being your underlying platform of choice. So I can use Kubernetes and build on top of Kubernetes with Kubevert, with Crossplane, with Cluster API, all of these different things to where Kubernetes can be the platform of choice to do everything, manage VMs, create VMs, create resources outside of Kubernetes, like an S3 bucket, Cluster API to do your infrastructure as code in a Kubernetes manifest. And, and this is this is probably my most favorite part of platform engineering from a technical perspective right now is that Kubernetes can literally be the underlying platform for everything. Kubernetes is perfect because it's now officially boring. And I think that's like the most beautiful thing, like Kubevert and watching like Red Hat Open, uh, the Red Hat OpenShift virtualization. So I've been talking OpenStack a bunch. So I'm still got that. Like the idea of being able to do long running workloads and bring VMs over, that's pretty cool because now this is like 
it truly is an alternative to other IaaS platforms. And I think we need it. And it's, I would say it's a fundamental break in like the model of Kubernetes was built that it was purely cloud native. OpenStack had the same thing. And what we learned was like, yeah, you can only be pure play for so long. That's why like Randy Bias introduced the idea of like, let's do an S3 compatible API. And in fact, we should have used the S3 compatible API for object storage instead of doing it with our own native platform at OpenStack. And same thing for EC2. Like, so we did it for S3, but we didn't do it for EC2. And that likely would have changed the direction. You know, now with Kubernetes being so pervasive, you've zeroed out that if you understand Kubernetes that you will be wasting that time. Like yep. it is an investment in, in infrastructure and, and in your future, because it will be the platform of choice, especially when you get to edge deployments and smaller scale. The only thing that can run cleanly and consistently you want to have the same operational model. So mm -hmm. Kubernetes just makes sense. Yeah. So we, we got a really good question here. Thank you, Paul, for bringing this up. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on my developer hat here and talk about immutable versus mutable. So thinking about state, all right, a state, especially like in, in, in Terraform, Paul mentioned, you know, talking from a, a Terraform terms here, state is like saving a video game right? You save a video game. And when you open up the video game again, you click continue or you click new, right? Sometimes you can continue or sometimes you have to create a new game, right? Your state is essentially saying, here is what the infrastructure looks like. I either want to add to said infrastructure, which is mutable, or I need to create new, right? Im immutable. So if it's immutable, you must create new, you must destroy and recreate. And that's what the whole idea of the state is. The state is, hey, here's where it is currently. Do you wanna to add to it or rather, can you add to it or do you need to create net new? Yeah, and a good follow-up question uh, for that I'd have for Paul as well is, are you thinking in the terms of like drift management, Paul? Or, cause that that is, so Terraform, fantastic at what it does and like general state awareness. But unfortunately, when you get into Terraform operating, especially EC2 and a lot of the AWS infrastructure, I say this, I don't mean to be like all AWS just because I, I spent the most time there. Um, one of the problems that I have is that there's eventual consistency challenges in how Terraform interacts around state management with some of the backend AWS infrastructure. And so I've had like really weird things happen where if you have long running workloads and long running clusters, Terraform starts to get a little out of sync. Um, so that there is a challenge in that whatever you do, does it effectively understand the true state of your cube infra so that as you're doing new deployments, you know, will it know to put it into a new cluster because the old cluster is basically about to get locked and, and thrown away? <laughs> right, right. And the, the way that if you're thinking about it in that fashion, the way that Kubernetes handles it is essentially everything is declarative, right? So, and everything is self-healing. Now, I, the, 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 the term or phrase self-healing, this is actually not magic. So what I have on my screen here is a test operator via Cube Builder, right? So essentially what Cube Builder is, is it's, it is a uh, way to create an automated operator. Now an operator consists of a Kubernetes controller and CRDs, custom resource definitions. Custom resource definitions are the extending piece of the API, of the Kubernetes API. The controller has this right here, your reconciler, right? Your reconciliation loop is what consistently and constantly checks the resource and says, is it is how it's supposed to be? Is my current state my desired state? So for example, thinking about the uh, replica set controller, right? The replica set controller in Kubernetes is what looks and says, hey, th this deployment is supposed to have uh, two pods. Does it still have two pods? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. If that answer is ever no, it then looks to see how it can reconcile the pods to go back to two. And the way that that happens is 
this reconciliation loop. So the state is pretty much based off of in this declarative fashion, the reconciler, it's constantly checking. The controller is constantly checking to confirm that current state is, is desired state. Very much like how uh, GitOps does its thing, right? GitOps controller confirms current state is desired state, right? And it's doing the same thing. And it's getting this concept right from here. So if anybody's, if anybody watching has wondered how Kubernetes does self-healing, this is how it does it. It does it via the controller's reconciliation loop. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. If not, happy, happy to go back and uh, answer the question again. Yeah, so on that, Michael, is this, uh, is this something that would be what is the underpinning to the regular readiness probes and the, and the actual health probes? Like, is that the same concept? That's what, like a CRD is just another representation of what's core in a regular readiness, readiness probe? So the readiness probe is essentially readiness liveness probes. The whole idea behind them is they're confirming that the overall health of what's running is good to go. Right. The CRDs and the the, uh, the operators and the, the custom resource definitions, the operators, the controllers. This is the whole idea of uh, expanding the Kubernetes API. So when we expand the Kubernetes API with the CRD. That's essentially saying that, hey, I want Kubernetes to be able to do something for me that it doesn't already have. And that's why when you see all of the various uh, vent, like all the various tools like Argo CD, for example, like Crossplane, like Cradix, it's just extending the Kubernetes API. And how can it do that? Well, that's actually the whole point of Kubernetes. Aside from running containers, the whole point of Kubernetes is having this extendability architecture. It has this ability to take itself and say, oh, you need me to do something that I can't already do? Here's an open API. Go make it happen. And then you build your API and then you build a custom resource definition and a controller based on Builder, right? Or whatever else. There, there's the uh, operator SDK framework and I believe there's one more that I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but Cube Builder is typically the go-to, right? Because it's it's pretty straightforward in terms of uh, how to get it up and running. So that's the ability to just extend itself. What's your? Uh, I, I remember one of my first people I watched that sort of had the hey, careful! Like when when, when CRDs became a thing, it was Sasha Rosenbaum. Sasha, I think I think she's at actually at AWS now. She was at Red Hat for a long time, uh, and, and said like. Hey, you know, the old like clapping hand thing of like, we don't need CRDs custom for everything. Like, yeah. cause what happened was people were basically creating CRDs for like Nginx. So you're like, yeah, mm -hmm. you, you, you don't need that. It actually has sure. a native built-in probe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. So only, I would say only to, to your point, Eric, only create an operator if you actually need to. Like this, like a creating, extending an API should only be if you absolutely need to, and if something doesn't already exist. And that's why you see vendors and tooling creating operators, right? Like you're not seeing random people creating operators. I'll preface this because although you can, so like you could technically create CRDs to, for example, create a best practice uh, from a repeatability perspective. So like I could create a CRD that is deployed to create a namespace, get X amount of pods in there, put this tool in there uh, and get it up and running on dev staging and prod. Like I can extend Kubernetes to create my own API to create a best practice workflow for my Kubernetes environment that kicks off every time a new client comes in, for example, like I can create that workflow for, a, for every new client. Do you need to do that? No. Could you do it? Absolutely. Would it make sense to do it? Actually, yes, it would. Uh, but the thing is, is that you don't really see that a lot because it's you need to write it and go. Um, or, I mean, well, no, you don't need to write it and go because there are several other clients available for other languages. The problem is from a support perspective and from a docs perspective, it's primarily in Go. So if you need a little bit of help, it's most likely going to be in Go. And the thing is, is not every platform engineer, not every DevOps engineer is going to be fluent enough in Go to be able to do that. So it, it all depends on, on your internal expertise. 
you know, we think of what the purpose of the CRD and anything like this is around life cycle management. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a, this is the same thing as we used to have, like, hey, should I refactor my like client server, single node, you know, HR application that we just use for annual compliance? Mm -hmm. You know what? No, just port it into Kubevert and leave it as a VM, run it like IaaS. Why in goodness name would you want to <laughs> spend hundreds of developer hours refactoring something for you know to be able to run in containerized environments when it's it gets an annual application update like there's so much wasted effort being spent on like hey we need to make everything cloud native no kubert and being able to do long running workloads safely like stateful sets is like it's a thing right, right. you know it's so that and then same thing with CRDs. It's like it's not that we can build, but should we build? You know, what's the actual mm -hmm. reason we do it? Is because we're going to have continuous lifecycle management. And if you're not building your CRD in your operator, because you're you're just going to blow away the whole state, and then you're going to have some other immutable image you add in. Uh, you probably don't necessarily need to go to the level of writing your own operator. Right. Yep. Exactly. Flavor to taste, I suppose. It's uh, that's what all of this ends up becoming. It's like, eh, it depends. So welcome yeah, to yeah. welcome to technology. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I guess it also depends on like how much you want to engineer. Like for me, I mean, because I'm self-employed, I have the uh, I have the ability to tell myself that I can over-engineer if I want to, and then I can go and I can play with stuff because nobody tells me no except me. Uh, and mm -hmm. Don't, don't get me wrong. I do argue with myself often. Uh, there are multiple personalities happening in here, <laughs> but, but you know, sometimes, so sometimes I have to bring myself back and be like, no, 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 chill out. Uh, but other times, you know, if I'm just kind of riffing along on a weekend, yeah, like I'll, I'll over engineer something. And, you know, so, so like creating your own operator to do what I was just explaining, what Eric was saying, like, yeah, it could be considered over engineering because there are a lot of products and features and, and tools that already do that for you. But Maybe, you know, you may work in it like if you work in an environment where, you know, your management and stuff is like, no, 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 go create this thing over engineer like you're super lucky. Right. Because um, it's super fun to, to just, you know, riff out and and have a good time doing it. Uh, yeah, gotta, I think it's, oh, sorry. It's, gotta, yeah, it's definitely that idea of like it's methodology. The reason why I wait, it's good to over engineer when you have free time and capabilities to do so is because when things go wrong, that's when you need to know kind of where to go. And I think that's really when everything goes right, you know, it's everything is great until it's not. And then it's really not. Exactly. And so to be able to jump in, understand where do I go? How do I go and directly check the API? How do I check the health of the environment? What are other ways that I can interact with my different systems? Being able to do that quickly through a CLI, through some other means, you know, or building other tooling around it to understand like, where do I go? And I think that's kind of what, you know, same thing we talk about Paul and Gaurav and, and all, and, and lots of these folks are mentioning like, what's the right tool to begin with, mm -hmm. especially as a student, it's like, state will be stored in many places. Mm -hmm. Your DSL, your language, your semantic interaction layer will be whatever you're comfortable with. There's lots of options but just understands the touch points and connectivity points and where things go sideways. Cause all of a sudden when you're, you can't reach your backstage UI, then, okay, now what? Well, right. you can reach the API. Is this the time you want to be Googling? How do I get a CLI access to like be comfortable in the code? Mm -hmm. And that lets you be closer to the metal when it comes down to, we should never have to be there. That's the whole idea of all these abstraction layers. Mm -hmm. So that, like what Paul said, like at some point state is still managed. It's just represented or visualized in another product, but the state's right. still being managed inside AWS, inside, you know, whatever you know, your implementation is. Yeah. And it's, I think it's also just a matter of like, even though there are so many pieces of abstraction right now, there are some times where you have to like pick things apart and truly understand what's happening from start to finish, you know, and we can, we can then put on our, our physics hat and talk about first principle thinking where it's like, take something and pick it apart from start to finish, right? From the bottom and you work your way up. Cause a lot of people start from the top and go to the bottom, but sometimes it's very, most of the time it's very beneficial to go from the bottom and, and work your way up and pick it apart to truly understand what's happening underneath the hood. 
Yeah, I, Kelsey Hightower did a really great early, like when he was doing early Go stuff, I remembered one of the things he did as a great lesson was building a very simple HTTP server. And right. the, the sort of the code you could you could you had to do to build it, it was relatively simple. It was a great explainer. And then the end deployment is like a single executable that you can port to any platform. But the executable is massive. It's like 19 lines of code and it was like a 27 megabyte executable. But it wasn't that we were going to run this in production. It's so we understood the way in which it interacts between the different systems. And that was the reason the lesson was important, not because you want to build your own HTTP server. You know, like we've got Nginx, stop it. <laughs> or Apache, whatever is your, your <laughs> server choices. We don't need to re-architect that one. Exactly. Yep. So the next thing here is port. Uh, and and the folks at port are really nice. Uh, like I, I was having an issue trying to figure out the self-service piece. Uh, and I went into the port Slack channel and I was like, hey, I'm having it. I'm just trying to figure out the difference between like these like entities and the self-service. Uh, and the port CTO was like, oh, yeah, I'll hop on a call with you. Uh, and, and he hopped on and he kind of showed me a bunch of stuff in port. Uh, but there was, you know, there was a lot of really cool capabilities in here. Uh, so port is like your, and I'll call it your enterprise version of Backstage. Uh, it's not open source. It, you know, there are paid pieces of it, et cetera. Uh, but it is an IDP, right? It's an, it's an, it's an internal developer platform. And there are a bunch of capabilities here, but I do just want to show one. So for example, you have this self-service hub and if you, let's say, for example, uh, go to edit here, well, you can't cause this is my account, <laughs> but if you go to create, uh, you'll see something very similar to where the gist of the self-service and notice here how I'm pointing to a, uh, a GitHub action. The gist is this, <clears throat> the self-service piece of port, it'll take one of your existing pipelines. You'll configure it here where the path is, all that good stuff. And then it'll give you a button. So if I click this button, it'll create a Kubernetes cluster, an EKS cluster, right? And then same thing here, I have a button for delete. So notice here how I'm actually pointing to a GitHub action or GitHub workflow, whatever you want to call it for a destroy.yaml. And this destroy.yaml is, and I can, can pop this up here. Those, those, those the, these two buttons here, and this is really good for like, if I want to give this to somebody that doesn't know GitHub actions or doesn't want to know GitHub actions, right. Or doesn't have access to deploy via GitHub actions. I could just give them these two buttons and these two buttons point to, uh, where are we? Well, and while you're digging for that, I say like this, this is the core of the platform engineering story, which is mm -hmm. operators that can understand development and developers that don't need to understand operations, but right. we, we know enough about each other so that we can create life cycle management products for developers to make the developer world better. Mm -hmm. And then that we have a greater understanding of new patterns of application operations so that we can then just make it like it should be self-service on both sides. They should give me a, a co a pipeline and I give them a build pipeline for infra. Exactly. So then I'm accessing the development pipeline for deployment. They access infra for testing. If they want to spin up a cluster, the last thing I want them is digging around in cloud formation templates to build an EKS cluster. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and that's the really, really good point is what am I doing as a platform engineer? Well, here's what I'm doing. Number one, I'm creating a repo. Number two, I'm setting up this repo for things like authentication to AWS, right? And then I'm creating these pipelines. So for example, destroy.yaml, right? I'm creating this pipeline. I'm putting in all the configurations that are needed. I'm pointing it to where it needs to go for the destroy, right? I'm then creating the pipeline within the action itself and do, do do all developers and engineers need to do this? No, absolutely not. So again, what I can do instead is I can give them this button. So now they just, they have this button that they can utilize and point to and say, all right, let me click this button. Apologies, everybody. If, I, if, you, if I'm coming in wacky, 
it looks like my connection is unstable on my Wi-Fi for whatever reason. So if I'm cutting so out, so far you're clean over me. I've seen every word, so uh, you're you're hanging in. Awesome, cool. Yeah. So so what I'm doing here is I'm building all of this stuff on the back end as the platform engineer, and then my customer, the internal engineers and developers, right? My customers and my clients, they say, hey we need a way to delete our EKS clusters. Can you give us a way to do it? Sure can. I'm gonna build this pipeline. I'm gonna write the code. I'm gonna do all the thing. And then I'm gonna give them to, uh, I'm gonna give that to them as a button. Here's the button. And this button points to my pipeline that I created. They don't need to know any of this pipeline stuff. They just need to know here's a button and there it is, right? So uh, cool, and that's the whole point of an IDP is to give people a button to do things with, whether you're using port, whether you're using backstage, whatever. And to to what Paul's point he brought up before is this then at least represents the state to the user so that as a developer, I know what's going on. And if my cluster goes sideways, then I can delete, recreate, and it will have some, I don't know exactly what level of drift management it represents there, but it's that's really kind of the thing is like, we should not have to maintain state in 17 mm -hmm. different layers. <laughs> we should represent it visually through how the self-service portal looks, but not necessarily have to do it where like they have to build some, you know, goofy UI just to like interact with testing state. It's, it's, it's there being transferred between these products and generally any platform engineering, you know, product, is going to be it's going to do a lot of things that other products do which is why it's confusing to garab's point like which one do i choose kind of all of them but just like choose you know network management choose IaaS management choose container pipeline you lay you change the names of the products it's like how do these interact that's that's really what you're learning as a platform engineer agreed yeah and then last, but certainly not least, and uh, again, please feel free to ask questions. Please, please feel free to ask me to dive into anything. I'm happy to dive into stuff as well. DevTron. So DevTron, uh, I don't believe that their messaging does them justice. But the gist is, is this. DevTron isn't creating new ways for you to... Uh, you know, like their own GitOps controller or their own monitoring or their own whatever. They're like a central hub. So this central hub, you essentially tie in your Argo CD and you tie in your Grafana and you tie in whatever else you're doing and you tie in your pipelines and you literally just have this like central hub to uh, deploy from or to look at things from or whatever. So you can actually give developers and engineers like this GUI and say, oh yeah, you can go click a button here. Or yeah, you can go look at things here. You know, so like I, I, you can see on, on the GUI here uh, on the website that it's like kind of going through back and forth, but you know, it's giving you all these different capabilities, but it's not creating new capabilities. It's saying, oh, you use this? No problem. Just import it over here. So your your logic doesn't live in DevTron. Your logic lives in the other tools, right? You're just incorporating it in, which is interesting. Yeah, and like for the folks at DevTron, I know a guy who's really good at messaging and positioning and uh, mm -hmm. and technical marketing. So if you need help, head over to GTM Delta. Now, sorry, that's a shameless plug, but like <laughs> that, it was funny. I'm with you that I've always struggled with their messaging because. Mm -hmm. It's real. It's true. You know, adopt Kubernetes in weeks because mm -hmm. it usually takes months. What, right. But no one tells you that. So unfortunately, there's not a relative like so their framing of it is unfortunate because it should say adopt in weeks instead of months, you know, or mm -hmm. like better adoption because what it really is, is like, how do I have all of my cube operations in one spot? including the adjacent interactions to other platforms, which is monitoring, logging, other, the, the, the oxygen services that I used to call like DNS, you know, where's your container registry, like that all gets rolled in. So then you have one place to look and see the general state of the overall environment, not just the cluster. Yep, agreed. And uh, what well, looks like we got one last question here. Would good docs with cli commands not serve the same purpose as port and be free at the same time? 
Well, yes, but no. Uh, and the reason I say yes and no is because obviously, like, so you have a UI, right? You have a user interface and that user interface could be a CLI or it could be a GUI or it could be an API or it could be all three. Port is the, the GUI piece, right? This is your button clicking. A CLI is obviously a different type of UI, but they're not the same because one is graphical, one is command line based, one is programmatic. Uh, so it all depends on like what you what you want and what you need, right? Yeah, I think to to what uh, what he's mentioning is the idea of operation versus versus visualization. It may be that the GUI tool also has operation capabilities that are based on the same APIs that your CLI and your SDK uses, but it's trying to represent problem in Kubernetes at the CLI is like sticking a pen in your eye because you can effectively only look at one component at a time, but being able to actually visualize the entire chain of dependencies that's where like as a troubleshooting tool and a general like operational view tool that's why visualization is still super cool you're i i love interacting through the cli with stuff more than anything else but i also know that there's a lot of folks that are just not quite comfortable enough there because right. i'm not a coder myself either like i'm actually a the, i'm like a scratch coder at best so for me to be able to jump into a ui and say oh okay and then I can work backwards from that. So, yep. and uh, this 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 statement we have here, uh, shout out to uh, this guy is a principal cloud architect at Mercedes Benz. I've talked to him a bunch of times. I, I don't want to name drop him because I don't know if he wants his name to be dropped or not. Uh, but he's a he's a, a principal, I believe, principal cloud architect at Mercedes Benz. And uh, him and I spoke a lot about like the Kubernetes architecture and stuff over there because uh, they're they're running, you know, I think like a thousand clusters or something on, on uh, OpenStack. So uh, definitely check this out as well here. Uh, they have a lot of awesome R&D stuff that going on over there. Uh, you know, I don't I don't really think Mercedes Benz needs me to shout them out, obviously. Um, but. They have some really cool stuff over there, so go check them out. <laughs> it is cool. In fact, some of the greatest uh, products have been built from companies that have like a problem at scale, and then they create a an internal engineering product, but then they open source it. And next thing you know, like look at you know things like Spinnaker that was you know a Netflix project that became mm -hmm. huge for everybody else. You know, mm -hmm. like stuff like that where, and like Mercedes is a great example. SAP does a ton of stuff. There are lots of single product companies even in technology that create adjacent management tools that are super good for platform engineers. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, even, even backstage, right. Backstage was built at Spotify. Right. And exactly. Was, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. And, and to your point, you definitely see that a lot. Um, what was, uh, like Walmart Labs used to have some really fantastic Walmart stuff, labs. especially in the OpenStack uh, ecosystem. They've got now they do a lot in Kubernetes as well. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot because I can't remember all my and it's so so popular. In Intuit Services, the financial firm. Uh oh my gosh, what what did they build? Uh, <laughs> Intuit Services Kubernetes. Oh, what did they build? Um, it's going to be one of those ones as soon as I hear it, I'm going to be like, oh, yes. <laughs> what did they, did they build Argo? Did Intuit build Argo CD or did they build Helm? It oh would be gosh. fun to go through like the like timeline of like almost like a documentary, like those like metal documentaries, yeah. so, like so the origins of Kubernetes. And like, I mean, I'll always say that the success of Kubernetes is, you know, I'll say primarily, or I'll say there's a significant win that came from the lessons we learned with OpenStack that allowed Kubernetes to get rid of early problems in how they manage the project, how they manage the uh, the separation of administration and and ownership of 
where stuff lives. Like we saw a lot of early pains in OpenStack with networking and how they did networking plugins. So that meant that as Kubernetes began, we already had a good model that we knew what wouldn't work. And so it's a great way to do it. So, oh, that's cool. And then uh, thank you to IHOP for sharing that one. So yeah, Alexander, <laughs> Matt, whew, Alexander M uh, mm -hmm. is the co-creator of the Argo project. There you go. So Exactly. Yeah. So cool. I, I know, I think Argo was like originally built or designed at Intuit. And I feel like Intuit did something else um, as well. I, I mean, can't remember. And let's look at that. Like, as far as when you look at a commercial platform, like I said, God bless the fine folks at VMware. I did a, I still do a ton of stuff with them and I had done for years, but I used to tell people when I was working, you know, I was working at Turbonomic and, you know, I'm talking to customers and, and developers all the time and, you know, in the open community as well. And I would say like, remember that like JPMC is, you know, or sorry, City Financial, a lot of these big companies, they have more developers than VMware does. Mm-hmm. Like, mm -hmm. so who we're actually seeing way more innovation in some of those companies like Spotify, Netflix, Intuit, right? That when they share it with the world, it may inspire a vendor to integrate that and, and build more on the project. So I think that's, that's pretty awesome that we have that level of innovation that's going on everywhere yeah. and that we can share it here. And like you're writing about this stuff. So your blog's got this stuff. Your channel's always got amazing content. And then you're bringing other people on. So it's basically like a who's who of doing what. And right. that's why like the podcast, when you're doing your, your Kubernetes podcasts, the ability to say like, why are we doing it? Who's doing it? That's also great conversational stuff. As me, like I've totally ripped apart your beautifully technical layout of what you're going to do today. And me, I've just made this meandering conversation about the industry history. But look at what happens when we actually dig into some of this stuff. It helps us to give good context that when we choose a platform or a product today, like worry less about the life cycle, the applicant of the product, worry less about, you know, who are the primary contributors? Just like, does it solve the problem I need to solve as a platform engineer? My problem is to solve other people's problems, which is my right. customer, which is my developer. Yep. And that that's it, you know, and the tools will change. Whatever tool you're using now, in three years, you're gonna be like, why are we, what are we still doing with this stuff? How do we support it anymore? Like, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. I mean, some would even say that VMware may be gone in a year. It's not true, but like <laughs> an acquisition can can do a lot of things for you. Yeah. I surveillance getting acquired by Cisco. Yeah. Does that suddenly have a lot of people going like, whoo, should I think twice about using Cilium now? Like no, no. You should always think twice about everything. Yeah. But just be aware, be involved with operations. A platform engineer is the like the pulse of the ecosystem internally. And it's such a beautiful opportunity to be a generalist with specializations. Yeah. And then when the new product comes along, then like we were scared of Kubernetes. Well, we were scared of cloud. We were scared of virtualization. We were yep. scared of large scale distributed systems, right? Like whatever it is, it will come, it will go. But the more you involve yourself with content like this and practical lessons like this and what you do in your, your workshops and your training, that just means that I'm building a human methodology to adopt new tools and understand why it matters. So I choose whether to invest time in it. Yeah, and and you know, to, to your point there, that's a that's an awesome that that's an awesome thing to be thinking about because we've seen, you know, when virtualization first came out, everybody like there was not everybody, there were a couple of people that thought it was going to be just a toy. When cloud came out, that's people right. thought it was just gonna be a toy. When PowerShell came out, there were a lot of sysadmins that were like, you know, our jobs are gone. Uh, now here's the thing, and, and this is a trend that we, that we can see when all of these things have come out and when everybody thought it was going to mean jobs were going to go away, it created more jobs and tons of startups. Like <laughs> not like it actually created an economy mm -hmm. because of changes in technology. Yep, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very interesting. And 
wrapping up here, uh, I do just want to give uh, Eric a moment here. He runs and owns and co-founds and works 16 hours a day on a great uh, <laughs> on a on a on a on a great content creation firm here. And Eric, if you want to just do a, do a little uh, plug for yourself. Oh yeah, thanks, man. I uh, really appreciate it. And yeah, GTM Delta, uh, uh, we I say I give emotion to technical content, right? So we create technical product marketing content for startups, enterprises, uh, and what we do is we actually create it as private label content to help augment your existing team or become your technical marketing team as a service. There's a ton of stuff. Uh, there's basically we've got everything from traditional just blogs and, and white papers as well as we do webinars and hackathons and we work with great folks like michael to do stuff like that and in fact we're going to see a lot more coming into this year that hopefully you and i and and your community can collaborate because i want to bring more stuff like this to the market where we can say like can i save you the first bunch of steps and this type of one-on-one -on -one content. So there you go. I'll say, I'm a YouTuber now. So I gotta say, hey, one in the chat, if you like this kind of content, right? If you like this kind of thing, you know, make sure drop a comment here, follow what Michael's doing on the channel. And this is a great chance for us to build a community. And, you know, on, on my side too, the goal is to build the largest, most vibrant practitioner community that helps with, we've got freelance content opportunities and, and lots of freelance opportunities. So feel free to hit me up. I'm Disco Posse on all of the, the interwebs. Uh, easy way to find me on social. And um, it's because Eric Wright is also easy E. So don't look up Eric Wright. You're just gonna get a lot of pictures of, of somebody with two nines crossed his chest. Uh, so I that's Disco Posse, you'll always find me and uh, would love to chat with folks and, and hopefully we'll do more of these and, and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll dive in. Cause I've got, let's just say I'm already a preview. We've got, how do you run machine learning pipelines on Kubernetes? This is one of the biggest holes in the ecosystem right now. There's a lack of content. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're going to collaborate together. We're going to create a bunch of really wicked, good content to help folks understand how to try out new things. Cause Hey, while well, everybody else is trying to figure out how to use chat GPT, we're going to teach you how to run your own GPT. There you go. Yep. And, and to Eric's point, uh, if you're into content creation and you want to get paid for it, uh, Eric's always hiring. So definitely reach out to Eric. Uh, I'm sure he's got some awesome opportunities for you. Yeah, and just connect on LinkedIn. Uh, that's always sort of the easiest way to reach me because uh, I, I I basically post and ghost on every other social media platform. So I, <laughs> I'm actually not there often. Uh, but uh, in LinkedIn is profoundly my new favorite place. Uh, I guess this is what startup life does to you is that now I'm a founder seller, you know, uh, so I got a, I, I interact with a lot of my clients through there and, and would love to, to chat with them. And thank you to everybody for the amazing questions along the way. I love the interaction. Thank you, Michael, for the chance to participate. Is this the, we're, we're, we're getting close to the end of the year. Uh, what's yeah. your schedule for, are you doing any more streams prior to, uh, new year's Eve? You know, it's funny. Uh, people always text me like, Oh, are well, what are you doing? What are your plans for the holidays and stuff? And I always send that SpongeBob meme where it's like he looks at his list and it's like, go to work, go to work, go to work, go to work. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, um, I other than my client related streams, my streams are pretty random. So I most likely will stream again at some point before the year. I don't have anything particularly scheduled, but usually what ends up happening is uh, I wake up in the morning and I have an idea and I'm like, this would be cool to stream. So most likely, most likely. How about yourself? You, you got anything good going on before the end of the year? Yeah, uh, just basically big marketing plans around, you know, I've got new offerings. Uh, we've got a, I got to refactor the website, uh, some content building. I'm in the midst of writing a book on, you know, operating machine learning uh, pipelines on Kubernetes. So awesome. that's going to be kind of fun. And, uh, uh, and too many, too many projects on the go for sure. So now that most of the client side work will wind down for about a week and a half. Right. That just means that we get to spend time on all those side projects that are, they become main projects for a couple of weeks. And, sure. uh, and then, yeah, New Year's Eve, new year, new you, new me, new, you know, new tasks and new streams. So looking forward to go. 
a wicked good 2024 coming up. Are you using Kubeflow in your book? That is going to be part of it. So it mainly is like, what are the different platforms? And it's similar to what we talked about here is like, what what are the methodologies? What are the risk points? What are the, uh, like general practices? And I also do want to get into real prescriptive solutions. It's always tricky when you get books, as you know, Michael, like when we do code samples, like I did an OpenStack book, I've done uh, Terraform books, Azure, AWS. The moment you press publish and you print it, it's like, it's not cleanly deprecating. It basically is just <laughs> dead code that will no longer work. I still get comments on blog, like PowerShell blogs I wrote like 11 years ago. Some are like, hey, this doesn't work. I'm like, I hope not. Because I wrote it <laughs> like, it was like PowerShell V1. Like it's, it's a miracle if it works. So uh, there's a life cycle involved in supporting your content. So, but yep. I do prefer to get prescriptive, real deployable solutions rather than just mm -hmm. like stay in top level, despite my keeping us kind of there on this stream. So uh, hopefully people can bear with me while I've just kept everything at the 30,000 foot level. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, thanks a lot for joining, man. I appreciate it. And thank you to everybody that, that tuned in. We had like 30 people, which is uh, awesome because I feel like the majority of live streams have like five to six people. So Thank you, everybody, for joining. Really do appreciate it. Don't forget to smash that like button. Hit the subscribe. Make sure you follow Michael's page and uh, wherever you are, then, yeah, connect. Uh, and this is re really, really cool. And if you've got an idea, drop a comment, too, uh, if you want to see future content, because yep. this is these are what, what I love about collaborating with Michael is that the focus is on the practitioner and real working production grade solutions. We oh, yeah. dabble a lot so that we know what the real production grade result is. So it, it's good that, you know, we basically, we do the hard yards so that we can hopefully save you some of those early, uh, early times, but doing it in the wild and doing it in public is really awesome that I love how you do it. Thanks a lot, man. Same to you. Appreciate it. Appreciate the kind words too. All right, everybody have a good weekend.